Okay. All right, Bill, thanks for coming on the podcast. I know we've been trying to arrange this for a while, but we see each other weekly at networking events. So um, finally got you on the calendar to sit down for an hour and talk about romance and what you do and your business and how you started doing it. So maybe you want to go back a ways. You're a little bit older than me, not much, a little bit. And, uh, you know, where are you from originally? What other businesses have you been in? And how did you get into doing what you're doing, the romance coaching? Okay, well. <laughs> we got a lot of time, don't worry. Well, I got into this business after my first marriage broke up. Okay. And as I like to say, I was the world's worst husband. <laughs> and how long ago was that? Uh, that was over 50 years ago. Okay, long time. Okay. And uh, when the marriage broke up, and I realized how badly I hurt her. And I realized how does something that starts out so joyously crash and burn in a rumble of disaster and heartbreak? Which is very common, right? Right. Yeah. And I decided I was going to start doing some research. So okay. I started reading books on relationships. I was talking to lots of people. I was living in Manhattan. I was in the employment agency business, so I had access okay. to lots of people. Right. So when people came in and they told me they were divorced, first question was, how'd you meet your spouse? Why did it end? Right. And I began to see patterns okay. that developed. Um, and, you know, conversations constantly over. And then I was putting some theories together and practicing with my friends and right. Um, and uh, I, Bill, let me go back a little bit because you said that your marriage broke up 50 years ago, right? Or, uh -huh. So that you're in, you're what, in your late 60s? I am going to be 73 next week. Okay, but that means you were in your 20s. I was 21 years old when I got married. Okay, so and how long were you married? We were together for seven years. Okay, but still, you weren't even 30 yet, right, at this point? Correct. Okay. And that's when you started like figuring out like how come this didn't work? So that was a long time ago. That was. Okay. I thought you just started doing this like a couple of years ago or five well, or 10 years ago. What happened was I had all these, you know, I was doing this and doing my research and then I met my second wife. Okay. And uh, we were married for 13 years. Okay. And uh, when that marriage broke up and we had a son. Then I really decided I was going back into my research and I was going to figure this mousetrap out. I see. So you put it down for a little while. So that's like mid forties. Is that when uh, that I was probably in my forties at that point. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I just, again, I was single. I had a young boy he was three years old when we split. So I said, you know, I started to do work at parents without partners Okay. Jewish community centers, right. learning annex in Manhattan. And I was running classes okay. and running groups for single parents because I said, you know, look, you know, if you come to these meetings, I'll put events together that we could take our kids to on the weekends. Okay. So that was great because the parents had adults to talk to and right. the kids had other kids to play with. Of course. So it was a win-win for everybody. And for me, it was a great place to get information. Okay. But it wasn't your career at that point. You were no, just doing I had it. a career in advertising. I spent okay. 30 years in advertising. Got it. So at that point, you Damn. were still in advertising. Right. Okay. And real uh, advertising, not like everything's changed nowadays. This is like real advertising, like mad men, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so um, it was in the uh, late 90s when I decided that I would write a book. Okay. Uh, so, because I kept calling everything I did romance by choice. So I said, let me write a book. Okay. And the interesting thing is I wrote the book and then I read the book and I said, it's boring. <laughs> so yeah. I thought maybe I'll make it an audio book. Okay. So I bought all this audio equipment. Had you published the book. book yet at that point? It was no. it published? No. So no. you had just written like a manuscript and manuscript, right? Got it. Okay. And you didn't then think it was that interesting. No. Okay. So I made the audio book. Okay. And I listened to that and I had the same feeling like you didn't this. Like nobody's it. gonna spend their time listening right. to this. So I was always interested Plus, in Plus in those days, Bill, we didn't have 
if I'm remembering when that was. We didn't have like Audible. You had to get like tapes, right? And you'd listen in your car or whatever. It right. wasn't downloadable, was it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe if at just that about, point, right? Yeah. It was. No, most of it was on CDs and right. stuff. You played exactly. them in your car and things yeah. like that. So then I got the brainstorm because I, I was a musician and I had always had a love for music. Now, what did you like about the book? Did you think the content was boring? or were The you content was it? good, but I felt no one would take the time to listen to it because it's like droning on. Okay, on. okay. So, so you needed a personality to do right. it for you or something. So when I got the brainstorm to do music, okay. I spent almost two years auditing music All to right. find the right songs that would express my feelings of romance and what I thought was the things that people needed. Okay. And I wound up creating six albums that go along with the audio book. Okay. There's an album on how do you prepare for love? What is the attitude you need for love? And then okay. two albums for a man to give a woman and two albums for a woman to give a man. Oh, okay. And then I took also songs and I put them, interspersed them throughout the audio book. So I'll make a point and then I'll use music. Like for example, right. I would say to someone, you know, the big question with everyone is, who are you? Okay. So when I would talk about that, I'd stop and I'd play the music from the who, who are you? Oh, okay. Okay. Realizing that sometimes you're not going to remember what I said, but you'll remember the music. Probably, yeah. So that's what I did. So I spent a lot of time in recording studios doing this the right way. Right. And uh, finally in 2006, I released the audio book, and at that time it was on CD. So it took a while to get it together. Yeah, it took me yeah. two years to put the music in. Right, even in 06, I don't think you could just like buy a, a, a microphone, plug it into your computer. You needed to like- No, be I had audio equipment. Yeah, you had real equipment. I still have the equipment somewhere. Right, okay. And- uh, You can go back into podcasting if you got the there equipment. There you go. <laughs> so that's what, that was the, you know, that's how the book came into existence. And then I started to promote the book and I started to do some coaching and mm -hmm. I've been doing it. Were you it still in that. advertising at that point when you started doing yes. it? It was like a side hustle type right. of thing. Okay. But were you even charging for it at that point? Oh yeah. Okay. And, um, and I, and that's been my passion, real passion ever since, because uh, there's nothing greater than seeing someone get clear right. on, wow, this is really what I'm looking for. And I don't have to waste time with people who aren't what I'm looking for. And, and it goes beyond, way beyond just the physical. Right. Of course. And, That's the least of it probably, right? Right. Well, it's part of it. But yeah. see, when I explain it to people and I say, this is how you date. When you go out on a date, the person calls you up, you meet for coffee. That's the first thing you would do. Like they go out and meet them for coffee on a Saturday afternoon. Right. And you spend 20 minutes. Right. And if the person isn't what you want, you leave. Yeah, that's a safe way to do it, right? And if they are, and the only way you find out if they are or they're not is by strategically asking questions from the list that you've compiled of what's right. imperative to you in a relationship and what's important to you in a relationship. Right. And I don't just mean that, oh, they're tall and good looking. Right. I talk about, you know, their religion, their education, their ethnicity. Right. Uh, we just go through it. Children, the whole thing. Yeah. Because you have to really choose for yourself what it is you want. I mean, I've met with people who, you know, married someone of a different religion. Yeah. And didn't problem, realize right? until yeah. after the marriage that the re one partner demanded a more of a religious aspect. Right. And that side that then the whole thing blew up. Yeah, of course. And you would think that it would be something that would be discussed, but people don't think about it. Well, I think we focus too much on the, the physical attraction, which only lasts so long. I mean, yeah, you got to be attracted to your partner. I've been married 22 years. I still love my wife. She's beautiful for me. But if we didn't have anything in common or we had different beliefs about how to raise our kids and everything, it would never, you know, it's never going to get you past stage one, right? Exactly. Yeah. But see, people, and so like an example is I had one client who said, I said to her, 
tell me about your last three relationships. And she said, okay. every one of them was with a mama's boy. She said, only children. She said, never, because I can't get the mama won't leave them alone. Okay. So I said, well, that's easy. When you meet someone and you start a little conversation with them, right. you might say something like, oh yeah, my sister's driving me crazy. By the way, do you have any brothers or sisters? And if they say no, get out of there. <laughs> and if they say, yeah, I got two sisters and a brother. Well, now right. you know they got, they're understanding family. Right. So you can stay. So yeah. this way you don't waste time. Right, of course, been waste doing. a lot of time. And she said, wow, you know, I never thought of that. I said, duh. Right. But well, people don't treat it like it's a, like it's a business. I mean, people don't do treat their business as well. They treat their relationships worse. Right. You know? So when you know the things that are the, what I call imperative. Right. Things you will not sacrifice that you must have in your life. And this only comes from you examining who you are and really getting into who you are. Because not who your parents made you into. Right. Or your friends or your relatives or your religious leaders. It's all about you, who you are. Like okay. I'll give you a great example. Yeah. Uh, I better not, I shouldn't say that. This would be, no, I won't say that example. But uh, <laughs> They'll know who you're talking about. Well, it's not that. It's just, no. Uh, but anyway, the, you know, it's the, when you're, when you truly know, if you, I don't care if you tell me I like someone who's six foot six or I like someone who's three foot eight right. or someone who's 300 pounds or someone who's skinny mini. Right. I don't care. Right. There's no judgment. Yeah. But you are the one that has to look at this person every day. Yeah. You've got to live with them. Right. So you need to be happy with whatever floats your boat. Right. Now you find out the younger they are, the more flexible they are in their thinking. Because uh, I guess it was as we get older, we get more set in our ways, things that we like, things that we know we don't like, things that we really don't want to do. Has that been well, a little bit of both. Because when you're young, you don't have much experience. Right. That's a good point. Right. The older you are, Yes, you, you may be more set in your ways, but we also work on that because the thing is, you know, okay, you're 46 years old, you've been married, you got two kids, you know, that kind of thing. But it's, hey, you know, tell me about you, who you are, what do you think? Right. And then when someone says to me, well, this is the kind of person I want, well, I'm going to challenge them. Right. Okay, I'm not just going to believe what you tell me right. because we need to know whether that's your thought or what you're trying to make your sister happy with, or your mother happy with, or right. whatever. Right. And We're also notorious for not saying the real things that we, like we think we want something, mm -hmm. but it's not really what's gonna make us happy. And then when we go after it, we realize, wait, I don't want that. And people are indecisive all the time. Yep. And I guess if you're not a little flexible in your thinking, you'll never find somebody, right? If you're so rigid in what you want, then you'll never, have a relationship. It's two people in a relationship. Oh, no. To the contrary. Yeah. I think people should the be The more very you can define, because see, there's imperative and then there's important. And okay. we define the two. Right. That's, that's imperative. That's you must have. Right. Important. You're willing to negotiate. Okay. So if you said, you know, I have to have a blonde person with blonde hair. Right. Well, I meet someone with brown hair. Yeah. That's got to be important, not imperative. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. You know, well, is that a deal breaker? No, if everything else is there. Yeah. So these are the things, that, and sometimes you could sound like you're splitting hairs, but once you have built, and I, I tell people, you know, we use, remember that old song, 100 Pounds of Clay? Yeah. Well, I kind of use that song in there because I say, look, I'm going to build the person. We're going to build this person you want to meet. So now all you have to do is tell me every single thing about that person. Right. And we talk about all those things. And then how are we going to, you know, physical is easy. After that, what are we putting into this person? And right, the physical is the easy part, right? So when you know all that, now you know who you are. Right. Now you know what you're looking for. Right. So now when you write your per profile, as to who you are or the problem, what you're looking right, for. Right, like online, you mean? Like an online right, profile? Like an right. online profile. Right. 
I write profiles for people totally different. Yeah, I'm sure. And than they would. what people do. <laughs> right. Because most people, you know, if you ever look at profiles, they all say, I like hiking, biking, jumping out of airplanes, climbing mountains. Right. I don't know why everybody wants to do that. Right. They probably but, don't. They just want to sound interesting to the right. people that are reading the profile. You know, and, you know, we, so we make the profile real, but we also make the profile not so much about you pushing yourself. It's about you stating who you're looking for. So now the person reading that says, whoa, that's me. Right. Or forget this person. I don't have nothing to do with that. Right, of course. Well, Good. you don't want to waste your time, right? Right. But the thing is, people don't get that. They think the more inquiries they get, the better, the better. they'll be. Better no, you, you want quality. Fewer you want inquiries. quantity, right? Right. Yeah. Right. It's all about the quality of who calls you. Because when clients call me back or... If even sometimes it happens while we're still in sessions and they'll say, well, I, I got, I got an inquiry from somebody. I'll say, good. How does that person stack up against your ideal person? Right. And they'll say, ah, pretty close. Okay. You know, they have this, they know. So we'll talk about what they know of the person already. Yeah. And then we'll say, well, maybe you need to find out a little more about this or that. And we work on that. So that, yeah, maybe the first person that you meet isn't the right one. Right. So let's not waste time. Next. Right. Because <laughs> the thing a lot of singles do is they get caught up with someone and because they're desperate, they stay. Right. right. So now because I'm dating you all of a sudden, I, I'll ignore any other inquiries right. I get. No, because people don't like change. So if they're there, they got in, they're there, they're like, you know what, I'm going to see this through and they don't want to change and walk away and start over and have to go to look for new people you know especially before all this internet stuff right and now it's a little bit easier to connect with people but you know whether you know i told people I, I i give them homework to do okay which is a big part of it because i want people to get out in the world and practice okay so i might have someone you know i'll say to people do you ever go to a restaurant and eat by yourself most people say, no. Why would I do that? Right. I don't like that. I say, okay, this is your homework. You're going to a diner on Saturday morning about 11 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to sit at a table by yourself. You're going to order breakfast, and you're going to sit there, and you're going to go into that diner impeccably dressed, whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. Okay. You're going in there. Yeah. And you're going to see the test is, does anybody approach you? I don't care if they're the right or wrong person. That's not what we're here for. Right. What we're here is to see, do you attract anyone? The same thing I might have them do at cocktail hour. Okay. You know, I'll say, go to this fancy like happy hotel. Like at a bar or something. Right. Yeah. And I want you dressed to the nines and go in there and walk in and I teach them how to walk, how to own their space. <laughs> like and that. when they walk in, I said, the whole idea is, is anybody going to approach you? Right, that's a good exercise. Yeah. And Plus, it not, gets, you don't feel like you're doing it just on your own. They feel like you help them do it, like it's their homework. So they're probably- Right, they have to do it. Yeah. Because I remember, I'll tell people stories of that. I'll say, would you ever go on vacation by yourself? No. I said, why? I used to go all the time by myself. Yeah. yeah, my wife's best friend, single. She's in her 50s. She travels the world alone. Yeah. You know, and some people, they love that. A lot of people are afraid of it. Well, I used to, I said, you know, sometimes you go, I used to go away knowing that, because I used to like Cary Grant movies and James yeah. Bond movies, wherever you yeah. go, you go there, you yeah. get all dressed up, go into the dining room at night, then there's always somebody. Right. Sitting there. A single woman would be sitting there and I could go up and say, would you like company? Yeah. What's the and worst thing she's going to say? No? I'm waiting well, for somebody. Some might, knows. but yeah, of course. the thing is, if you don't try something, you're never going to succeed. Right. So a lot of single people will not travel by themselves. Yeah. And the worst thing you can do is travel with two or three of your friends. Because yeah, then what you do- anybody. You'll never but you anything. do meet someone, but now you've got baggage. Yeah, right. Yeah. So now, oh, I can't go because my friends want to go here. Right. 
<laughs> See? So if you travel by yourself, you're so free freedom. to do what you choose. Yeah, exactly. So this is the kind of, this is some of the homework that I have people do. Right. So it gets them out of their shell a little bit too, right? Gets so. out of the shell. They, they practice going out. They see what happens. Right. So they can. And some will say, yeah, somebody came up and talked to me. <laughs> right. Or maybe the wrong person came up or maybe nobody did. Then you can talk about that. Well, why do you think that is, right? You're like kind of a therapist, right? Right. Well, you know, have you, were you open enough for people to come up? Because sometimes you've probably seen this many times. You'll see somebody sitting there by themselves and they're sitting there like closed up, like they're totally unapproachable. Right. Yeah, that's another way. You got to be open to make it. Right. So you got to practice. Yeah, I'm not going to go talk to that person. They might punch me in the face. I'm not right. doing that. Exactly. Yeah. So the, these are things that we do. Right. In the program. Very good. You know, it's not just, you know, how do I put this? Um, I mean, people can have success if they just purchase my audiobook. Is it still available, the book? Oh, yeah. The book's yeah. available. It's on my website. You okay. can buy it through All Sound. Good. Um, is it downloadable but, now? They don't have to buy the albums and get it No, it's downloadable. In? I had to have it all redone. Right. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't have turntables anymore. We don't have CD players yeah, anymore. Yeah, I know. You're right. Somebody said that to me the other day. I got this CD, and I looked at my lap, my computer. I go, I don't think we can play it. I don't have, I don't have a CD player well, anymore. The funny thing was, I had a client recently who when I met, when I meet with people in person, when we're able to do that again, right. I usually bring them a thumb drive with the book on it. Ah, okay. But this person said to me, no, do you have it on CDs? CDs, right. Yeah, I said, yeah, I have some old sets <laughs> yet, and I brought her a set of the CDs, and that's yeah, how she wow. listened to it. Yeah, that's fine. I don't even think I can do that in my car anymore. I don't think- No, can. most cars don't yeah. have CD players. Right, I don't have that, yeah. You're right. It's funny. Forget about cassette tapes. I don't have those. Right. Either. So Somebody told me yesterday about Betamax. Remember that? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's before like 8-track and v VHS and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, you never so, did any video. It was always audio? Uh, audio. Yeah, audio. Okay. And I, lo I love the concept of the, of the ideal person because it's like an ideal client profile for business owners. You know, right. like, who do you want to do business with? Who do you want to meet? And how do you want to meet them? I don't think I there's enough thought into it you know i always use the analogy that single people are like used cars right there's no new ones out there right so if you needed a used car and it was you walk onto this massive used car lot and you start walking up and down the aisles you'll probably buy nothing right because you just can't you can't, there's nothing there. Right. But if you go in there and say, you know, I'm looking for a Chevy about three years old, black or baby blue with black leather interior, X number of miles on the car. Right. Now you can go to the used car lot and right. chances right. are you'll come away with the car. Yeah, because you're looking for it with a purpose. Right. Yeah. You know what you're looking for. Right. So if you find that Chevy that you like, and it's black with black interior, but it has too many miles on it, forget it. Right. Okay? But you keep looking because you know what you're looking for. Right. Well, we don't date with a purpose, right? We just go and get drunk at a bar and meet through friends and giggle and laugh. And, oh, well, she's cute. He's good looking. And then, boom, then you're married and then you get divorced. Well, you see, the mistake people make is – they're too quick to rush into the sexual aspect of a relationship. Right. Well, that's because we are physical, emotional people, right? Right. Yeah. So, but you, the you, people today, you meet someone on the first date, right? You want to come back to my place? Sure. Yeah, okay. like what is the one? Tinder? One of them is like you swipe left and then they hook up. It's like barely <laughs> so, dating. <laughs> right. So the thing is, when you do that, and if the sex is good, that's all you care about now. Yeah, now you, you overlook a lot of things, right? Right. The person yeah. could be an axe murderer, but you <laughs> don't know that. <laughs> You'll find that out the hard way. But by that time, you now have what your heart invested in somebody. Right. And now, and you've also invested time. The average yeah, which, relationship right. will last 60 to 180 days. When you that's do the it. average? That's the way most of them will work. 
even a, even after you get married or no? From no, the no, day no. You the meet. way it is now, okay. when people just hook up oh, yeah. with whomever they right. meet. Six months, they're out of it. By that, yeah, if not right. before. Right. Because all of a sudden, I start to see, oh, I don't like this, or how come you didn't call me, or why are you yeah. doing this? All those problems start, and then it blows up. Right. So, and then you're on this hamster wheel constantly. Yeah. And after a while, you get tired of it. I've met a lot of single people who say, you know what? I'm just so sick of it. Right. I'm not even doing it anymore. Right. I'm happy with my life the way it is, and that's it. Yeah, and a friend that's a of mine, sad thing. A friend of mine years ago said, you know, she was used to look for her knight in shining armor to ride in on the horse. And then she got to the point in her life she'd settle on the horse. You know, <laughs> she's going to think there is a knight in shining armor out there. But that's, that's human nature, right? You get frustrated from your own experience. And if you're just, I think the problem is we don't really go into it with a purpose. We, we just, we're, we're socialized as we get older. And then you go to high school, you meet your first girlfriend, your first boyfriend, your first whatever. And then you go to college and chasing girls around, chasing boys around, chasing other people around. And then you start experimenting in life as you mature, but you never really, there's no train. Well, you're giving them training, but there's no training to relationships yeah. very much. You know, you, you, so what, do you remember like, why did, obviously a lot of people have been through what you went through, right? Meaning they got married, maybe young, got divorced. Maybe they found their, their second wife. Maybe they stayed with their second wife. Maybe they didn't, right? You didn't. Like, why do you think it was in you to make a career out of this? You know, to, to, to really say, well, I got to figure this out. Do you know why? Are you that kind of person or? I, I, to me, it was, I, I felt so guilty about causing so much pain. In, so, in your life or in someone else's in life? In her life. Yeah, okay. And I did this, you know, because, you know, I probably shouldn't have gotten married. At all? At that time. Right, because you were young and not, right. And, not sure. you know, but I did. And then I did all the things that men told other men they should do. Which is a really bad way to take advice, but we do right. it. And, you know, and of course, you know, we're also now into a different time. Right. You know, women have evolved. Yeah. And, but men haven't. So, yeah. I don't know if unless people understand how to do this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, it's like, yeah, every once in a while you meet someone who says, oh, I met my husband or my wife. We met at a something and we've been married for 35 years. Right. They're great. Yeah. And I love him and he loves me and we're great. Everything's good. Terrific. Right. But, but that's, that's the small that's, story, right? Right. That's the, the exception, not the yeah, rule. Right. I mean, exactly. what they say, fifth, divorce, marriage is 50% of the marriages end in divorce. Is it 50? Yeah, about half. That's what they say. But second and third marriages have a higher percentage of divorce. Yeah, probably because you've been through it before. It wasn't so bad when you broke up the relationship. You're not happy. You're like, oh, I'm moving on, right? Right. It's because like, you didn't it's not learn your first time. Right. You didn't learn. You didn't learn anything the first time. Right. And now you do it again and you make the same mistakes over again and the same thing blows up. Right. So I, that's where, you know, so that's why, you know, I, it doesn't matter to me the age of the person I'm working with. Right. So, you know, I've met a lot of people in their 60s and they say, well, is there really hope for me? Right. I said, now there's a lot of hope for you. Right. You got to change your mindset a little bit. Right. But, well, you know, I mean, 60 is like the, what do I say? 60 is the new 40 or Let's whatever. hope so, because I'm 53, so I hope that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, but these are the things. People are so much younger, more vibrant than they used right, to be. Right, sure. Right, because and, you used to retire when you, my grandfather retired when he was 65, and he retired, and he, you know, he died in his 80s, but I don't think he did much after that. And right. now, my dad's 76. It looks like he's, you know, my age. I mean, he's just very active. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a different world. There's no question about it. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, people are entitled to love and romance, no yeah. matter what age you are. And there's all and there, people are looking for different types of love and romance, depending right. upon where they are. Of course. Sometimes it's just companionship and somebody to share their life with. And sometimes it's, you know, when you're young, you think everything should be hot and heavy, I guess. Right. Well, yeah. you know, we, we grow up with this whole Cinderella idea with all these it's things that they put yeah. in our heads that, you know, Prince Charming is coming. And, right. You know. Well, we get that from the movies and from TV and books right. that you read and, you know, romance and, your, and all the stuff that goes on. And that's nice. It's fun. And the, 
they live ever, happily ever after, but they never show you like what happens after the prince and the princess fall in love because they probably half of them get divorced, you know, <laughs> right? Princess Di and uh, Charles, they get divorced and that's reality because people aren't compatible. I think it's funny because I think people don't like spend the time learning about relationships and how people think and are, and, you know, socialize. They, they don't treat it like a, not a business is the wrong word. That's too cold and calculating. But, they, you know, they don't treat it like it's a partnership. You know, I'm not saying that you should say, oh, you know, I like to do this and you give that up because eventually you're going to get pissed about it and it's going to blow up your relationship. You got to be compatible. But I think that people don't recognize that it's a two, there's two people in a relationship, not one. Some people are so inflexible or they overlook things so much because they think this person's beautiful or whatever. Like you said, the sex was good or whatever it is. And they overlook a lot of things as opposed to really taking the time to say, you know, how does this work and what's important to me? And I thought the stuff we were talking about off mic that you told me about called the nothing box, the, um, the videos online. I mean, it's so true. Men and women are so different in the way we think and digest information. I'm not sure as men, we digest any information, but we, you know, and women want to talk about everything. They want to share their emotional men. I don't know. We just want to watch some TV and have us leave us alone. <laughs> well, you know, now that you brought that up, there's a there's another interesting aspect to current types of relationships. Okay. And because we have women who are now successful business people and they're out right. in the career world and they're running companies and they're right, doing sure. all these things, what happens is that causes a woman's testosterone to raise. Right. So now you have a, a person who comes home. She comes home from her high-end job. Right. Her testosterone is high. Right, powerful. The man comes home and his testosterone is high. Yeah. And you're, now you've you're, got colliding forces coming yeah. into the home. Right. So that's not good. No. The reverse is, or another aspect is, the woman comes in, she's all charged up, but the man has not. He did not conquer his day. Right. So his testosterone is down and his estrogen is up. Right, and there's an incompatibility there. So now he's really feeling bad, so there's right. more room to fight. Right. And in some cases where you have now stay-at-home dads. Yeah. So they're, they're com when, they, when a wife comes home, his testosterone is low, his estrogen is very high. Right. So you have the reversal of roles. Right. So couples need to learn how to deal with this. Right. And most people don't. They're not even aware of it. Well, that's the thing. A lot of it is consciousness, self-awareness, right. realizing exactly. that that's okay, but we got to, you know, one person's got to come down a little bit. The other person's going to come up a little bit. And how was your day? And kind of pick each other up, so to speak. And I don't have to learn how to communicate yeah. with each other and understand what's going on in each other's world. You know, again, a lot of us, a lot of people are still raised by the old type of thinking. Right. You know, the man's the breadwinner. The woman does everything in the house. Right. And there are still women who try to do all that. And then they're having problems because they're, they're overworked and on the right. love. Yeah. They're and appreciated. So, and maybe they didn't want to really do that to begin with. Right. And then they found themselves married with kids and they're like, oh, I guess that's what I got to do. And that was never their ambition. Maybe they were right. raised by their family to go to college and to be a professional and this and that. And sometimes people give up stuff and they're, yeah. they're not happy about it. You know? Right. So the, the, the relationship world now is totally different than it was 30 years ago. Right. And unless people understand that, they're still mimicking that behavior. Right. I mean, I've said, you know, some parents have said to me, gee, my child's like 21. Do you think your program would help them? I said at 21, they should be out having fun. Right. But, the program could help them understand what the future is going to be. Right. And how they can, you know, learn to not make the mistakes that so many people make. Right. You're saying that at 21, it's a little early for them to be making their list and setting this and looking for the, right? Just have a good time, relax, get out there and don't right. put any pressure on yourself. But learn as you go. Right, but learn, right, be, be aware that, of things and say, you know, okay, right, this, and and pay attention. See, people don't pay attention to other relationships. Right, yeah, you know, yeah. 
And if you know, you're I, young, I don't, you don't have anything to lose. You can learn as you go and watch uh, things. And but we don't. We're never taught that. I guess you weren't taught that either, right? You got no, married young. I wasn't taught that. So yeah. this is the kind of thing that you know is destroying a lot and lot of why young people are having such a terrible time. Because when you're in college and you're partying, and all of a sudden you meet someone and you start dating, right? But that's in a different world. You're in a yeah. cocoon. Yeah, really. In college, you really are. It's not the real world. Right. So when you come out of college, right, the smoke clears. Right now, all of a sudden, you got to build a career. You got to make money. You got to find yourself. Right. You can grow apart easily. Yeah, very easily. The other thing is, there's an interesting book called The Keys to the Kingdom. Okay. And that book is all about how men grow up. And okay. the different stages that men go through. Okay. And in this book, it talks about until a man is about between 26 and 28 years of age. Okay. That's when he first starts to get some maturity. Yeah, we're slower, mature, we mature right. slower than women. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. And surprised. that's when he first starts to think about, I need a partner. Right. So people who, I tell a lot of women, if you're dating someone under the age of 28, don't get serious. Right. Chances are it's going to get rocky. Yeah, because it hasn't solidified for him yet. Right. In a lot of cases. And, you know, and men, and then as men start to mature, when they get into the business world, then they begin to realize when they're in their mid thirties, late thirties, that, you know what? I'm a knight, but I'm not a king. Right. Or I'm a prince and I'm not a king. So they look at men who have more than they have. Right. Start comparing themselves. And then men will go through in their forties, what they call the midlife crisis. Yeah. Because they're seeing this. So if, if a woman isn't attuned to this, she can't help her man. And what happens and what used to happen to so many men is that all of a sudden, younger women look more attractive to them because they're paying them some mind because the man has some prestige and somebody looks up to him and that's what he needs. Right. Because, you know, Men need to feel important. Women need to understand they need to make their man feel important. Right. And when you do that, then your man is like, will do anything for you. Right. <laughs> but if you don't, he's going to find somebody else who does. Yeah, you get a lot of cheating and a lot of people that are unfaithful. Right. And they don't even know half the time why they did it. They, they'll tell you, I don't know. I love my wife. I don't know why I did it but it's because they had something missing in their mind. They, right. didn't know. they needed somebody to look up to them and say, Oh, look at you. Right. You know, and that's what they need. We need that as men. Right. So these are things that the more men understand themselves, the more women understand themselves and they understand each other. Right. The much it's much more easy. It's easier for them to find relationships and make them work. Right. Now, a difficult question, a little touchy area. I, have you ever worked with um, homosexual people? No, I have not. Couples. You work with singles, really, but. I, I have not worked with homosexual couples or right. people, right. but that wouldn't be a difference. The principle would still be the same. Right, they're just different gender roles as to the right. role the person plays, and they go through the same thing, sure. And couples, I have, worked with a few couples only limited to the areas of how to create a little more romance. Okay. Um, you know, how to maybe communicate better. Right. But other than that, because couples that have been together have way more issues than I'm Want to tackle. able to handle. Yeah. Right. You know, you'd rather and start with somebody as clean slate and you can help them build it the right way. Right. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, you go into relationships right. that were built on sand and they're... Right. You're not a contractor who does renovations. You want to do new builds, right? Right. <laughs> Pretty That's much. That's a good way to put Tear it. Tear down you know? new builds. You know, I mean, it's... Um, now, I would really, think nowadays with the pandemic, it's a little bit... Um, maybe, I don't know about easier to meet people, but you don't have the pressure, like you said before, of like you go on your first date and you're like enamored with this person you think they're beautiful and you end up in bed with them well that's obviously not going to happen right now so you don't have any of those pressures clouding your judgment because you can't does that right. help a little bit 
Well, it does in certain instances, but what I'm finding, some of the clients tell me that, oh man, I'm having a ball because I can have seven dates a night. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, because you don't have any travel time. Right, I mean, yeah. they can just call up people or vice versa right. and you know, chat on, do a, do a Zoom call with them or a yeah. FaceTime call with them and go on to the next one. Right. The worst part is one person may say, think that that person likes them. Right. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of miss, uh, what's, they don't sync up. Right. Yeah. It's so funny. I have friends who have been married for a long time and they have kids and they're, I, I haven't talked to them in a while. I'm sure they're still in love. They went on their first date. I think there was set up between their parents and he dropped her off and she, and he went home and I think the mom asked him, how do you think it went? She, and he says, I don't think. He, she likes me. She had a problem with her leg or she had surgery or something. He was going to help her get in the house. She goes, no, no, no. She got out of the car. She hobbled down the driveway, went inside. It's like, I don't think she likes me. I'm not going to see. She went in the house. Her mom said, how did it go? She said, I think I'm going to marry this guy. They were totally <laughs> out of sync. And obviously they went out again and everything worked out. And they're, they're, um, they're happily married for a long time. But it's funny because there are exceptions to that. I mean, my parents met when they were 16 years old. They married and had me i guess they were 21 or something they're still married and much very much in love i have a very good friends of mine who are my age who met when they were also 16 i think we were all together and they're still together have kids but it's it's definitely you know it's definitely the exception because my parents also have a lot of friends that have gotten divorced several times in some cases you know mm -hmm. so it's uh but i think that it's you know we're just bad at figuring ourselves out let alone relationships well so, that's it you know yeah when I ask someone, who are you? Right. They can't just answer right away, right? No. No. And the other question that I ask everyone is, how do you choose to live the rest of your life? Right. Especially older people. Yeah. I get to work with someone in their 50s and 60s. I'll say to them, how do you choose to live the rest of your life? Right. You know, you might have 40 years left, but... How do you want those 40 years to be? It's yeah, your I never were asked that question, right? No. Yeah. No right. one ever thinks about that. Yeah. And, you know, it's the same thing when, you know, for young people also is if they knew how they chose to live the rest of their life. Right. They might not make such stupid decisions. Yeah, definitely would not make as many stupid decisions. But no one does that. I've often thought of, it would be great to offer this program on college campuses, but yeah, you know, that's no, a that's why the stand up funny ones on college campuses are more popular because they're better off laughing at each other. Cause it's, you know, they're, they're not at a time in their life where they're serious enough right. to accept this right. kind of stuff. Like it's still a game to them. It's still, it's not to the point where they're, you know, Oh my God, this is real. Like this right. isn't a, well, Look at how many people graduate college and have no idea what they're going to do for a living. Yeah, no idea. That's probably and, a lot more than 50%, right? Right. And yeah. There's a lot of people. That, so when you're doing career counseling, the whole thing is, you know, what is it? I always, I was, I've done some career counseling and I've said to people, well, tell me, what is it that you would do if you could do anything in the world? Right. What would it be? And I don't care if you have the skills or not. Right. Just make it a Tell blank. me right. what it is. What they would be your dream? Answer, right? Yeah. And once they get that out, and if that's true, right. then you can whittle through that whole thing and figure out why they want. If someone said to me, I want to be the center fielder for the New York Yankees, right. I'd say, great, but I can't play baseball and I'm too old. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. But what, what, is, the, what is the reason? that you, this is the thing you'd love to do most. Right. And if, it, if they really are sincere and they can really get it across, you know, maybe the bottom line is they'd be so happy working in a place teaching kids how to play baseball. Right. But they, were, they went to college to be an accountant or an attorney or something. Right. Well, stop being miserable and go do what it is that you're going to love doing. Every right. Day. Right. I remember telling my son from the time he was a little kid, I don't care what you do in your life, as long as whatever you do, you love to do, because then you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Yeah. If you love what you do, then the hard days are not so difficult.
Right. So yeah, that's, careers, it's even harder because as you make decisions, as you go down your career path, you end up down this path that you, in order to go back, you got to go very far back. So if you're in your fifties, you know, you can't just decide. I mean, people have done it. I know people that were attorneys and they said, you know, I want to be a chiropractor and they're 49 years old. They went to chiropractor school. Now they're a chiropractor, but not a lot of people can do that. But I would right. think relationships, you know, you, you get some do overs here and there, but it's harder as you get older. Well, again, if you're in a relationship and you're married, you have children, you have homes, you have all yeah. this stuff, responsibility, Hard and then you rabbit. realize, you know, by you're the time miserable. you go through divorce, it's terrible. Yeah. Then you got to deal with the kids. Yeah, so it's painful. There's lots but of if, trade-offs. I, I guess the only thing that gets you out is if it's more painful to stay in than it is to be out, then eventually you make the decision and you, and you get yeah. out. So do you know, and then I'm going to ask you some business questions because this is the accidental entrepreneur. So we got to ask you some business questions. Do you know of other people? Do you know a lot of people that do what you do? No. No. I've met one or two people who do something similar. Right. But it's more along the lines of matchmaking. Right. That's true. You uh, don't do that. Let's make that clear. You don't right. matchmake people. No. Right. And also, I've spoken to a couple of people who say they do something similar, but there's no substance behind what they do. Right. You have a program, a curriculum that you take them through, exercises that everyone right. does, things like that. So, okay. So let's get to the business side of it. So you, you were, at what point did you leave um, the advertising world and say, I'm going to do this full time? Uh, several years ago. Oh, so it wasn't. So you're really doing this while your career was going on in advertising for a right. long time. Right. Well, I started in 2006. So for a while, I right, 15 years. was doing both because, you know, it was fun. And a lot of people were easy to do it on the weekend, Saturday, right, like side Sunday. So. Yeah. So you retired from advertising. Is that what happened? Basically, yeah. And then you started doing it full time. And I started to do this full time because right. this you know, just makes me so damn happy. Yeah. Well, that's what's important, right? So how do you run your business? Like, how do you, how do you find your business, do business development? Um, you know, how do you Most come up with the fees you charge? Is it just, they buy your book? No, they got to pay you too to coach right. them, right? Well, I have a one, I have one price for my okay. program. My program is six sessions long. Okay. Those sessions can be six weeks or it could be up to three months, okay. depending upon how well they grasp the material okay. and do the work. And also schedules. Oh, okay. And I charge a flat fee of four hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. For the entire program. That That's includes it. Includes the audio book. That's it. Wow. That's generous. It is, but I don't care. Right. Well, you must have had a good career. So you can oh, but I've had people that. I've done this for for I hate to say it, for nothing. Yeah. I've given them my book and I haven't charged them a thing. Right. Just to help somebody. Yeah. Of course. Well, you got to do that sometime. Yeah. Are you, you back? We got disconnected a little bit. Yep. Okay. Um, so, okay. So people can buy your book separately, right? But if they sign up to work with you, they get the book with them. The audio version of it. Or is there a printed right. version of it as well? There's no printed version. No, just audio with the music, but it's all, it's all mixed together now. Well, it's, it, it comes in when you, you buy the, when you get the downloadable audio book, you get the albums are part of it. Okay. So everything comes in one package. Right. Each album is like a mixtape. It's like a mix of music. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you had to, it. so you had to buy the rights to be able to do that every time, right? Did that must have taken a lot of work. I did. I had to buy the rights to the music and then. Yeah re-recorded i did a lot of the singing i had other singers uh you know it was a lot of fun to do it just took a lot of time oh so these songs are not like the original versions this is like you and other professional singers doing the uh the music right covering the songs oh i didn't realize that are, is, do you sing i mean is that a hobby yes yours? yes oh can people so I see sang you? a lot of appear certain places or not anymore? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so and there's a workbook that goes along with it. So okay. the workbook has exercises in it and questions that they have to answer. Okay. That but that goes with the coaching, or they also get the workbook 
With if the, you download it, you get the workbook, the you get thing. the albums, you get the whole thing. The only thing you don't get with just downloading you. it is the coaching. Right, you. Obviously, yeah. But for four fifty, that's a steal. Right? Find yeah. love. Now, what do people come back for refreshers? Like, Bill, I'm off track. It's not going well for me. Well, what I do is I include a session about a month later and another session two months later okay. to follow up. Okay. Just to make sure that they haven't, you know, slid all the way backwards. Right. But they have the audio book. Right. They can listen to that and they have their profile and the notes that right. they took and the things they created. They have that to go right. with them. Go out and see people or do it online or whatever yeah. they're doing. So have you seen, like, I, I assume you have some um, uh, success stories, right? Are there any good stories you can share that are good success stories or interesting stories without embarrassing anybody on uh, to the 35 people that subscribe to my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, an interesting story. Uh, I was working with this woman who lived in Oregon. Okay. And she was an attorney. Okay. She had three elementary school age children. One of them was a special needs child. She was divorced. She was divorced. Okay. And when we started work, she said to me, look, I don't need a man to support me. I need someone who wants to be a partner. Right. With me. Okay. And I said, okay, so tell them what, you know, your biggest problem is. And of course, her biggest problem with men were she would meet men. And the minute they found out that she had a special needs child, they were gone. Yeah, that's a lot for people, so frankly. So remedy you know? that situation. Once we took the, put the whole course together and got her all set up with what she was looking for. Right. When I wrote her profile, I put in there that I'm a single mother of three elementary school age children one of which is special needs. Yeah, so they know that up front. Now, when she read that, she got very upset. Yeah, she didn't want she people said, to know. She said, why did you do that? Right. I said, because we take your lemons and we make sweet lemonade out of them. Right. So let's put it in there. I yeah, don't, don't want don't a man calling you up who is not aware of what he's walking into. Right. Now, he's not going to run away. Right. And I tell people that who have health issues. Yeah. Whatever your health issues are, let's put them out there. Yeah. Don't hide them. People hide things from other people. And then when that's discovered, they run away. Yeah, they go to oh. pick them up at their, uh, their apartment and they got an oxygen tank next to them because they got respiratory issues. I think people want to know that up front. Right. Yeah. So, so how did woman, she find you, Bill? She's in Oregon. You're here. How did? Uh, it was through a friend. Okay, referral. And, but in three months, she found a man oh, and they've there you been go. together ever since. See, there you go. Cause you did it the right way. So, well, yeah, she, the guy wasn't afraid. See, that's the key. Right. He went in with the right mindset. He went in with his eyes open. Right. He knew what he was getting into. Right. And it didn't bother him. Yep. You know, I have a lot of people, I say, you know, if you're divorced and you have two kids, how many more kids are you willing to take on? Right. You meet a person now who has three kids. Yeah. You want five? Yeah, especially if they're young. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, people don't think about that. Right. Because they're just hung up on the person. Right. Or there could be somebody who's younger. Let's say I'm divorced. I got a bunch of kids that are older and I don't want to have any more kids. And then you don't talk about that. Next thing you know, you're in a relationship and she wants kids. And you're like, oh, I don't want kids. Or... I can't even have kids anymore, you know, that type of thing. And you, you get a lot of incompatibility. So do you, do you find your people mostly from referrals and networking? You don't do any advertising or anything, no. do you? I so found it a little difficult to try to advertise it. Right. Because it's so misunderstood. Everybody yeah, so you really want nightmare. somebody, yeah, you want somebody who gets referred from either a former client right. or somebody who meets you in a networking group like yeah. we did who really understands what you're, you talk because frankly, I met you originally at the JBN in Livingston, right. and I didn't really understand what you did. And then we connected at another networking event, and we became friends. And now we're talking about it on, on the podcast. So yeah, yeah, it just definitely takes time. Well, that so, that's the thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, I found when I was dating, uh, before I met my present wife, and we've been together twenty years. Okay, is I remember a situation where I met this woman. I went to her house, and she had a daughter who was 13 
My son was five at the time. Okay. And I heard her say to her mother, if you think I'm going to watch that brat, you got another thing coming. There you go. Okay, goodbye. That was the end of that. <laughs> of course. Because, you know, so there's so many things that people need to understand what, again, what they'll accept. I knew I is, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't mind someone who had two kids, but I didn't want someone who had three kids. Right. So you, when you know yourself and you have your boundaries, you want to call them, you want to call them rules, you want to call whatever. Right. But you know, let's just go through it because it's not going to work in the long run if you're, if that, that issue is going to rear its ugly head. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's like you said, it's being self-aware of what you like, what you know, what you can be reasonable about, what's important or what's imperative. And if you take those things with your eyes open, you're going to make much better decisions. That's the problem. We make really bad decisions mm -hmm. in a lot of areas, not just romance, but right. romance is a serious one because it affects your life, someone else's life, maybe children that you have, parents, other relatives, all kinds of people. It's a big ripple well, effect. You know, I mean, I spent my entire life in sales and you know, in sales, People buy what you get them excited about. Right, emotional. They buy emotionally generally. Right. Yep. So yep. that's the same thing in relationships. Right, we big time. We buy emotionally. There's no question yep. about it. That's why we make so many bad decisions because decisions of the heart are usually wrong too often, you know? So, okay. So if people want to find you or communicate with you, your, your website is uh, romancebychoice? Romancebychoice.com. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes and a link to you. And Thank a you. link. Now they don't need a link to the book, right? That's on the website. That's on the website. Okay. And maybe any of the books we talked about, you mentioned a couple other books during the, uh, during our discussion, maybe you want to send a link and people can look that up. There was a couple of books you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. I'll put a link to the nothing box too. People can, can watch that. Cause that's very funny. Tried and true, but it's very funny. Uh huh. Yeah. But I appreciate it. We've been talking for almost an hour. Um, and, uh, this is great because it's not only a business for you, but it's interesting for everybody and the relationships. So I appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it, Bill. Okay. Hold on. Be well, enjoy the week.